Hi, you're watching Get Outside St. Tammany. This show is about all things outdoors. And today we are here with our guest from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Erin Olson. Erin, tell us what you do for the uh, wildlife and fisheries in Louisiana. Yeah. Hi, thanks for having me today. You're welcome. So I'm the biologist supervisor at the Michael C. Voisin Oyster Hatchery with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. And the hatchery is located on Grand Isle. Mm -hmm. And at the hatchery, we repro reproduce oyster larvae for restoration, sales, and research projects. And we collaborate with Louisiana Sea Grant for those research projects and for a breeding program as well as operating the oyster hatchery. So a lot of people probably didn't even know that there was an oyster hatchery. I know I didn't, um, but I may not be representative of the whole. But anyway, um, tell us what exactly, what, what, what is the hatchery? What's the hatchery? So the hatchery, if someone doesn't know exactly what that is. Right, so the hatchery, um, we have a facility and what we're doing is we're taking adult oysters and we're spawning or breeding them to produce tiny baby oysters, mm -hmm. um, oyster larvae specifically in the hatchery. And oysters have two phases of their life, the larval cycle and their adult cycle. So at the hatchery, we're producing these larvae mm -hmm. um, and we're growing also algae to feed them. So we have um, about 144 hanging bags of marine microalgae. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. So it, once the oysters are sort of propagated and they begin the life cycle, what happens to all those oysters in the hatchery? So after about two weeks of growing the oyster larvae in the hatchery, they develop a little foot. And at this stage, we call them petty villagers, petty like pedestrian foot. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, this is when they're ready to attach and to settle down and go through metamorphosis and then begin their life, their adult cycle. Mm -hmm. And so at the hatchery, when they reach that petty villager stage, that's when we harvest them out of our tanks. Mm -hmm. And then we can either store them and ship them or give them to oystermen that might have purchased these larvae. And they can go and what we call set them onto a substrate or we can take those larvae and set them ourselves for restoration projects or to produce seed okay. for sale. So now when you say set them onto a substrate, give us an example of what that might mean. So what we'll do for restoration projects is we'll fill a tank with oyster shell bags. And so they're about three foot long bags filled with whole oyster shell. Uh -huh. We put them in a tank, fill them with bay water, and then we'll sprinkle the petty villager larvae into those tanks. and right. then with that foot they look for the shell to attach onto they attach with that foot onto the shell and then they go through their metamorphosis and are uh, develop into a tiny baby oyster which we call spat oyster okay and then from there they'll grow um, bigger and bigger and then we'll eventually see them on our dinner plates so so they don't start out in a shell that's number one that's what i'm grasping they, the larvae they kind of have to find their shell they actually grow their shell right they away. grow their shell yes. That's very yeah, right interesting. Right after fertilization occurs. Okay, all right. So um, some of them you said are sent out and deployed on the reefs and some are uh, sold for the growers to grow on their own. So tell us about um, sort of the difference. Um, so the reef, the ones that are put out on the reef, those are to continue the oyster habitat and life cycle, is that correct? Yeah, so the ones that go uh, onto the reef will help uh, enhance the public oyster seed grounds. And then the ones that are sold will, uh, for Louisiana oyster men, will right. help supply the oyster industry. So what, what is um, a typical, I know you probably can't speak to what every oysterman does with their oyster larvae, but what is, <laughs> a, what, what is a typical um, process. So once they get the larvae, what, what, what do you know about what they do with them? So they're producing single seed oysters and specifically uh, a triploid oyster. And so Louisiana Sea Grant with their breeding program can produce a sexually sterile oyster called a triploid. So it's like a seedless watermelon. Hmm. And so this oyster stays medium fatty during the summertime when the regular oysters um, out in the wild diploids with two sets of chromosomes are spawning. Okay. These triploids stay medium fatty and aren't reproducing like the diploids are. Okay. So you can get um, so you can continue for a that season. Price through the summertime. Right, you can keep growing them. Okay. But, okay. Um, yeah, so the oyster men, what they do with the larvae, that was the original question, sure. they'll take them and they want to produce single triploid seed oysters mm -hmm. usually. And so they'll have a, a tank set up with very finely ground uh, culch material. Instead of a whole oyster shell, like what we use for restoration, mm -hmm. they'll use basically a grain of sand oh, wow. uh, type of material. And then you'll get one single petty villager oyster larvae to attach to that and then you'll produce a single oyster oh, to wow. sell and um, some of them are selling them to restaurants in New Orleans and they can be eaten on the half shell. 
Okay. Right. Yeah. And because we always hear about the um, oyster months and things like that, but this kind of is a different way to approach that. And so the summertime when oysters are in high demand for tourist season, they're available. Yeah, and they're not going to, they'll stay meaty and fatty through gotcha. the spawning okay. season. So, um, ha so we talked about how kind of the hatchery works and how the oysters go out into the public reefs and then some of the oyster fishermen get them and then they propagate them, sell them to the restaurants and that's how we end up eating them. But um, let's talk about the hatchery itself. Um, is this a place that people can learn more about, they can come and see it. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we would love for people to come down and take a tour of the hatchery and they can contact our fisheries research lab mm -hmm. um, in Grand Isle and the number is 985-787-2163. So you can just call and get a tour of the oyster hatchery and we have our fisheries research lab down there with wildlife and so fisheries. So what, um, what would they, what's like something they would see if you're going to tour an oyster hatchery? I have no idea what I would even expect. So can you give us yeah. sort of a walk through a virtual walk through okay. tour <laughs> yeah so usually we start with our farm so we have an oyster farm out in the bay where we uh, keep all of our brood stock and adult oysters mm -hmm. and that's what we use to bring into the hatchery so the next part of the hatchery is we go through the hatchery um, a walking tour and we start usually downstairs where all of our water filtration systems are we filter our bay water down to one micron before we allow it to go into our larval tanks or into our algae that we grow and what's the reason for that that is to remove any zooplankton um, that could eat the larvae or eat the food that we're feeding okay. our larvae. Okay. Yeah, so we have the cleanest bay water around. <laughs> and then uh, we go up into the hatchery and we'll explore our algae room. So we have an algae stock room and our algal production room. And our stock room is where we keep all of our flasks um, that we use to transfer into our algal production room. So we have small flasks of algae in there. Mm -hmm. Once they reach the cell density that we want them to, then we bring them into our bag system. And so the bag system is really cool. Kids really like seeing it. Um, we have red, white, and blue LED lights and oh, these wow. big, tall, six foot long hanging bags of algae bubbling up. And that's uh, where that the little room. oyster larvae are eating? That's basically. what the, al yeah, the algae is used to feed the oyster larvae. So in that room, the algae gets harvested and then it gets pumped into our larval production room, which is a bigger room in the middle of the hatchery where we have multiple tanks. We have a tank system that can hold 320 million oyster larvae at one time, wow. which is really cool. That's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. <laughs> we name every one of them. and um, You name every Yeah. <laughs> it's a big job. Yeah. And uh, we also have a brood stock holding system in there too. So if they come now, uh, you can see oyster larvae and the algae and our brood stock. And this is open year round? The for hatchery are, yes, for tours open year round. Um, our production season though is from mid-March to middle of November. Now specifically, what, I mean not specifically, but what children would you recommend? Like if you have an interest in what would you definitely recommend to go see the hatchery? Um, an interest in marine biology, the outdoors. This is a really great program that you're doing here to get people outside. And mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, it's about if you like the ocean and the outdoors, I think you'll really like the hatchery. Okay. So yeah. is there anything else you want to add about the hatchery, the process, the um, oysters, anything? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I, I <laughs> well, tell us one more time the phone number that people can call to come in and see the hatchery. Sure. It's 985-787-2163. Okay. And um, we appreciate you coming on with us, Erin, yeah, and teaching so us all much. about the oysters in the hatchery and how they're propagated and bred and everything like that. So we uh, appreciate you coming in. Yeah. And so that's our show. Thanks for joining us. And um, we hope to see you next time on Get Outside. But it would be safe to keep your distance until they're oh, secret. You smile. Mm -hmm. The sources say the chicken mm -hmm. soup has proved it's found their way out of this. Closer to nature can get you closer to your family.
discovertheforest.org. All right, and welcome back to Get Outside St. Tammany. Uh, my name is Will Afton, and I work with the LSU Ag Center here in St. Tammany Parish. I'm the uh, county extension agent, uh, and I have a background in horticulture, so I'm here to answer all your gardening questions. Uh, and I thought this month might be a great time to uh, talk about some, some very popular landscape plants that uh, you know a lot of people are purchasing at local nurseries and uh, planting out in their garden during the month of May. Uh, and that's the hydrangea. Uh, hydrangea is probably one of the most popular uh, sh flowering shrubs that we plant in our gardens and uh, Mother's Day weekend tends to be there uh, when uh, most nurseries sell the most of them so I thought it'd be most appropriate just to kind of highlight this particular genus of plants. We all know hydrangeas are kind of the staple of the southern garden. Uh, big extravagant flowers like what we see here. Uh, kind of large growing shrubs, great for the you know the back of flower beds to add some good dimension. Uh, they are deciduous though so uh, come you know towards the end of fall and winter time they uh, they will lose all of their leaves and you know just kind of look like sticks there but come spring they leaf back out and uh, you know come back to life so to speak so but basically there's a uh, kind of three main species of hydrangea that we uh, that we use in the landscape here in South Louisiana uh, the most common would be like hydrangea macrophylla uh, kind of like I have an example here this is one of the endless summer hydrangeas this one's called summer crush this is a, a patented variety, as you notice, with the, uh, the, the blue endless summer pod and the nice uh, the graphic hang tag here. Uh, uh, definitely, there's a lot more than this. This one, this is just one of the newer ones on the market. It's got this nice pink color. Uh, we also have this one to the left here. This one is uh, what we call oak leaf hydrangea. And uh, if you can see here, if we look at a leaf, you can really see where it gets that name, oak leaf hydrangea. Uh, it's got the nice lobed uh, leaf, very similar to uh, like a white oak or a red oak. Uh, uh, different species, but uh, related, they're in the same genus, so it's kind of, let's call them brother and sister. I don't have an example here, but there's a third species that's becoming very, very popular, and that's Hydrangea paniculata. Uh, these two hydrangeas and most of the other ones uh, that we grow on the landscape, they require some shade, so we can't put them in all-day sun. Uh, need to find an area that, uh, you know, it can get morning sun, but it needs some shade or it needs filtered light in the afternoon to really thrive. Uh, oak leaf hydrangea and this hydrangea macrophylla, they will burn up in afternoon sun. However, hydrangea paniculata can actually tolerate full sun and actually does a little bit better in full sun. Uh, a very common paniculata uh, cultivar is the limelight hydrangea. Uh, a little lighter in color, but same type of flower. Uh, but those you can plant out in a more exposed flower bed with direct sun. Uh, so anyway, once you, once you pick, got your, have your plant picked out, and then we have a good location to plant this plant, uh, just like any other shrub or you know, even trees for that matter, you've got to make sure you plant it properly. So uh, you know, may, read the information about each plant, learn how wide they get, use that to determine how far apart to space them. Uh, go ahead and lay them out in the bed, kind of space them how you want them, and then you come back, you can come dig a hole, uh, you know the side. You know with, to put the root ball in. We uh, actually recommend to dig the hole two to three times as wide as the pot that that uh, plant is in. Uh, that encourages some good lateral root development, and you can get an established plant a lot quicker that way. Uh, also, we're going to dig it a little bit shallower than this pot. We want the top of this root ball to sit maybe an inch or two above the soil grade. Uh, bad things happen when plants get planted too low, so make sure to avoid that by digging the proper depth, depth from the get-go. Uh, use all that backfill that came out of the hole to replant with these, uh, with these plants and any other, any other plant that you plant in the landscape. Uh, try to stay away from excavating soil and filling with a potting soil. Uh, creates a pot in the ground type environment and uh, it, has a, it creates an issue with water drainage. Uh, but anyway, once you get these things planted, uh, you know, we go through and we water them in to kind of help settle some of that soil. And then you can put some mulch, uh, you know, around the roots on to help with weeds, help conserve water uh, during those first couple of months. Uh, when it comes to mulches, you know, you can use any mulches, but here in St. Tammany Parish, we have a, uh, a multitude of pine straw. A lot of pine trees that grow here, uh, a lot of forestry land with pine. Uh, so pine makes a great mulch to use here. Uh, throughout the growing season, hydrangeas really don't have many problems. Uh, you know, if we go through a lot of high, you know, heat and humidity, sometimes 
Snails and slugs can be an issue. Uh, snail and slug damage shows up as holes in the leaf, uh, whereas a caterpillar might feed from the outside in uh, and consume leaf tissue. Snails and slugs will typically feed from the inside out, so we start to see these holes or whatnot. Uh, look for the snail or slug if you have that issue there. Uh, and then choose an appropriate pesticide. Most of your common insecticides will not control snails and slugs, so you'll actually have to look for a snail slug bait to control them. So. If you start to see holes in the leaf, inspect for snails, and if so, uh, choose the appropriate pesticide. The only other issue I have with hydrangeas are during heat and humidity during the summer months, they're very susceptible to a leaf spot. It's a fungal issue. Uh, spots develop on the leaf. As that disease progresses, it'll move its way up. Eventually, leaves will fall off a little prematurely and, uh, you know, of course, cause the plant stress, cause it to look bad. Uh, the best way to kind of fight fungal diseases amongst any plants is good sanitation. So go in there and pick up those leaves, bag them up, throw them out with the trash. That's in an effort to reduce the amount of spores that could reinfect that plant later on. So with good sanitation and then protection from uh, one of our common garden fungicides, you can uh, keep leaf spot to a bare minimum on these plants. So remember when using any kind of pesticide, you want to read and follow those label instructions so that you're putting it out at the right rate, you're applying it properly, and you're wearing your, uh, the proper protective equipment. Uh, but anyway, look, hydrangeas, very easy plants to grow, uh, work well in the south, that's why you see them all over the south. So for any more questions on hydrangeas in general, or if you have another plant that uh, you're interested in growing and want to know how it works in Louisiana, go get, contact us at the LSU Ag Center. At, uh, our website is www.lsuagcenter.com, and then locally here, the uh, St. Tammany Extension Office phone number is 985-875-2635. So, I just moved in with this family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born, and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that! That's disgusting! Oh, poop already! You're making me nervous! Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. Welcome back to Get Outside St. Tammany. My name is Will Afton, and I work with the LSU Ag Center here in St. Tammany Parish. Uh, I am the kind of the lawn and garden expert. I'm a trained horticulturist, and I can answer questions in uh, just about any gardening topic. Uh, today I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of explain, uh, you know, the month of May, you know, definitely spring is in full swing, things are going, you know, we're outside mowing the lawn, we're doing all types of gardening tasks. And one of those very common gardening tasks with pretty much any plant in the landscape is going to be pruning. And a lot of things are, uh, you know, some things are pruned in the springtime, some things are pruned later. Uh, but right now, all of the azaleas are pretty much done blooming. All those big formosas, uh, you know, if the flowers aren't completely gone, you can definitely, they're, they're brown still on the shrub. That is an indicator to us that it is okay, it's now time to come in and prune that plant back. I think that all plants need to be pruned once a year because it, uh, it helps, it, it encourages new growth and annual pruning, uh, you know, it really helps to to keep that plant looking good year round. So, uh, you know, it's not something you want to do every five years. I want you to get out there and do it every, every year. Make it a, a common uh, task to do outside. Uh, so, azaleas are spring flowering shrubs. There's a lot of other spring flowering shrubs. Some of the other more common ones would be uh, camellias, uh, Camellia japonica and the Camellia sisanquas. Uh, they bloom a lot earlier, some of them in, in the fall, uh, early winter time. But, you know, the Japonica camellias, they'll linger around into February and sometimes into March if we don't have any freezes. Uh, but once those plants finish blooming, that's when we want to come in and prune. Uh, and the reasoning behind that is those plants, they come, you know, about midsummer time, they actually start setting those flower buds so that they can uh, start to store energy and prepare for next season's bloom. So if you come in too late, you're going to cut off the blooms for next season. So just with your spring flower and shrubs, remember when they finish blooming, that's when you get out there and prune them. Uh, basically with pruning, we're uh, kind of reshaping the bush, uh, bringing things back to symmetry. Uh, you know, we don't have to prune things into a square hedge. 
uh, you know, a nice formal shape. We can still keep the natural shape, uh, but you definitely want to trim the branch at least a few inches uh, to somewhat of a shape there. So I got three pruning to tools here that are very common. Every, every gardener should have a pair, uh, and they kind of have different purposes. Uh, just wanted to talk here. This right here is uh, just what we call hand pruners. This one is a, uh, it's called a bypass pruner. So as you can see, this top blade actually bypasses that bottom uh, fixture there, and that's what makes the cutting action. Uh, this is probably the most commonly used pruning instrument in the uh, gardener's toolkit. Uh, this can be pretty much made on any cut. Uh, so you can, you know, if we're naturally shaping an azalea bush, you can grab each stem uh, and just make your prunes uh, using this bypass pruner. Sometimes though, the branches or stems that, are, that need to be pruned out, maybe it's a broken limb down in there, uh, sometimes they can be a little too big and uh, it's just not big enough for this little hand pruner to cut. So that's when we actually make the move to uh, something like this here. These are what we call bypass loppers. Uh, if you see here, it has the same type of cutting action as those hand pruners, uh, but you get this long handle for more leverage and uh, it's a more heavy duty uh, piece of metal here to handle those, you know, inch, inch and a half. And uh, depending on which uh, type of, what pair you have here, maybe a two inch size branch. Uh, so we use our bypass loppers for those bigger limbs uh, to make the proper cut. And then the third tool that we have here to use pruning is what we just call head shears. Uh, you know, everybody has seen these and uh, this is basically what uh, gardeners are using to prune that nice, uh, you know, square, flat, rectangular uh, hedge type pattern. Uh, these work just like a pair of scissors, uh, very sharp uh, and can cut stems up to maybe about a quarter of an inch. If you let them get bigger than that, you're going to have to be in there and use your hand pruner there. Uh, but anyway, so this is, makes nice flat etches because you have a very long cutting surface. It's very straight. Uh, however, I find on smaller bush bushes, if you turn the uh, head shears over, and uh, use them at this downward angle, you can still get a natural type shape when uh, pruning the bush. So definitely think about this. Uh, on all of these things, it's good to go ahead and use them. You always want to keep good clean tools. So once you finish up your pruning chores, you know, it's good to take a, uh, uh, you know, a metal brush, clean it up with some soapy water or whatnot, put a layer of oil, and then store them for later use. Uh, that can be said for all of these. I do want to point out when using a bypass blade, uh, the bottom blade fixture is actually not sharpened. It's only this top blade. And as you can see, it just has an edge there. That's the part that uh, bypasses this fixed edge. So if you need to resharpen it, if they're getting dull on you, you can use a metal file there. And uh, just make sure to only sharpen that one edge there. Always good, put a layer of oil and then uh, put them away. And that's how you keep your tools to last a lifetime. So. If there's any more questions, you can always consult with the LSU Ag Center at our website, www.lsuagcenter.com. And then locally, you can call the uh, St. Tammany Extension office uh, at 985-875-2635. Thank you and happy gardening.